PHT, interstitial diseases, all those things that we see are usually a result of accelerated decline of lung function. Once we reach adulthood, then our lungs, I think just like any other system, there is that normal decline, okay? But if you did not achieve your full potential right from uterus, first of all, I think your decline is faster. So you experience the problems of being an adult much faster and much more than somebody who has reached their potential because you already have a function that's suboptimal than health. So I brought up this, I don't know the point I picture from the internet, but it shows the different phases of lung development until about eight years. And some of the things that can happen, unfortunately I don't have a pointer, that that can happen at the different stages, but you can see from three to six weeks what we call the embryonic stage. And that's when really the lung is starting to form, those lung buds starting to form and differentiation onto the trachea and bronchus. So if something goes wrong there, then you have poor lung development. That's why you have people having no lung or no uh, branching of all those things. And then we have the 17, 7 to 17 weeks, 17 to 27. So what this chart is trying to show is that at different stages of lung development, if there is an insult, you can have a different result. And, therefore, and then the other thing is that it spans over a period of time. For example, between, let me talk about this one. Between 17 to 27 weeks, that's when you really have the type 1 pneumocytes appear, airborne blood interface appearing. So if something goes wrong with that, the alveolar formation is not right, the septa is not right, and therefore, eventually, by the time you are born, your lung function is not that good because already the alveolar and the septa between the alveolar and the blood air barrier haven't been formed optimally. And therefore, but the good news is that if everything, if we have some interventions that make sure that these stages take place very well, then you can actually have some of these things occurring normally, and then you have normal lung function by the time you are born. Um, probably that is explaining the same thing in detail. And now I go to the determinants. I just divided them into the major four. These are not the only determinants, but the major four which we probably can look at and where I think we can think through either in terms of research or in terms of practice, how to intervene. We have nutrition, and nutrition, not childhood nutrition, but maternal nutrition. We have biomass smoke. About 99% of our household use biomass smoke for cooking or lighting or heating. So we have this huge problem in our Africa, in our environment. Tobacco smoke and infections. But underlying all these issues we see is, I think, poverty. Poverty is really a terrible disease. Because poverty defines your social economic status, it will define whether you use charcoal or firewood which is not well dried, or you use a clean stove, or you have gas. And that will eventually determine your land health. It also determines whether you have milk or you have black tea, which is some people call dry tea, and things like that. It will determine the incidence of infections. So most of these things we see, most of the lung, pro lung health problems we see, we have poverty underlying. But in our context, the other things I wanted to bring out, the culture, especially for pregnant mom, there are some cultures where some foods are prohibited during pregnancy. You forget about the physiology where some women don't want to eat certain things. But culture may dictate what you may and may not eat during pregnancy. And therefore impacting on the lung health of your baby. And of course traditions, either the cooking traditions or different things. So as we try to think through the interventions for these major four, deep down there are things to do with culture, with traditions, with poverty, which at the end we must also address if we are to tackle those big four. So I think I'll go straight to uh, 
the fact that it's an optimal environment, and in this case, I'm mainly looking about both the intrauterine and extrauterine environment. If it is suboptimal, I'm, I'm very cautious not to use the word poor because I may not be able to define what is poor and not poor, but at least it's suboptimal. It leads to altered lung development. Eventually, you have reduced lung function, and this consequently increases your risk of having respiratory illnesses, either during childhood or even adulthood. And we know now that the long term changes in lung structure are linked. How your lungs will develop in terms of structure is the undernutrition, it's creature birth. I don't speak about that, there are already huge programs within the country addressing the preterm birth. The respiratory infections that you experience right from the later period as you grow. Maternal tobacco smoke, exposure to some allergens, we know it influences whether you develop asthma or not, and other things. And of course, the biomass smoke. And the reason why I highlighted those three, I think we haven't paid much attention yet to those. We do them in normal practice. The mother comes when she's pregnant, you ask her the food she's eating, and you list them down as a routine. You ask her whether she smokes tobacco, and you say yes or no. But I think we need to do more. And for biomass smoke, I don't know whether anybody, anyone of us, when we are glad with pregnant mother, we ever ask what they use for cooking and how much smoke they inhale on a daily basis. And yet, this biomass smoke actually affects the unborn baby, especially the lung function, and eventually by the time they come out, they have suboptimal lung function, which increases their risk of lung diseases in childhood and in adulthood. Okay, so to mention that the preconception factors are important, but they are difficult. People rarely announce, especially in our setting, that I'm about to become pregnant. Otherwise, then we would intervene. Mm. Yes, but from the public health perspective, the person who is nearest to us is the pregnant woman, especially if she comes within the first trimester or first noticing that she's pregnant, and then we can do something about it. But to mention that preconception factors such as the genes which I talked about, the nutrition, some diseases and things within the environment also eventually impact on her own health and eventually impact on the health of the baby. But after becoming pregnant, again there are factors which we think we can look at. I, again I point out the nutrition, the toxins within the environment, especially tobacco, the microbiome within the placenta and that brings in the infections that the mother may have during pregnancy, which influence the inflammation and so many other things, the genes, environmental interactions, genetic modifications and things like that. Those are really vital factors which we might be able to address when the mother is still pregnant. And then at the time of birth, of course, the process of labor and delivery and postnatal period is another difficult time for the newborn and things may go wrong which may impact on their lung health. They may get neonatal pneumonia, if they are born prematurely, if they are born, anything that may really affect their lungs may impact on their overall lung health as they grow up. And of course in childhood, what happens during the neonatal period, nutrition, infections and so forth. But mainly what I wanted to highlight that there are things that we can do during the gestational period to try and make sure that people have normal lung health as they grow up. I'll talk about a few, like undernutrition of the fetus. There are several factors that eventually affect the, or influence the nutrition of the fetus. Like if the maternal has, rather the mother has vascular disease, so I think that's why we have preeclampsia and eclampsia. And I'm glad the expert on eclampsia and preeclampsia is the chair for the session. Maybe we should throw more light on that. If there is any placental pathology, because that is really the feeding vessel for the, uh, for the baby or for the unborn baby, if the mother is undernourished, and if the mother is either using tobacco or any other drug. So what happens when we have that kind of undernutrition? We have reduced oxygen and nutrient supply to the fetus, and eventually you end up with a child who has intrauterine growth retardation and other related things, including the poor lung function. I decided to single out certain things which we usually don't think about. When you're asking about the issue, we want to find out whether the mother is having the energy giving foods. What are the other foods? 
Either the energy giving foods or their what? Body building foods. I'm finding out for our children in primary school. And <laughs> participate in the one more. <laughs> the either energy giving foods or body building foods or don't send me from the vitamins. They call them health giving foods in P3. So usually we are thinking about broadly. But if we are thinking about public health intervention, you cannot intervene with the entire diet of the mother. So I try to pull out what are those micronutrients which we can look at from a public health perspective and maybe supplement during pregnancy, either in terms of pills or in terms of food, which can actually have an impact on lung health. Some of them have been extensively studied, others they have been just looking at the associations between the different types of food. So first I pick out vitamin A, I think we have those foods in Uganda. So during the prenatal life, vitamin A influences the genes that are involved in lung morphogenesis, especially looking at airway branching. So if we have somebody who is deficient in vitamin A, maybe the airway branching won't be sufficient. And remember that airway branching eventually influences the alveoli that you have. So if airway branching is wrong, then something may go wrong as you grow. But also influences how the smooth muscle differentiation occurs, the developing airway. We need the smooth muscle, as you may know. Now, during the postnatal period, now this has been an observation that if your mom was deficient in vitamin A, then you are more likely to have asthma or breathing illnesses, moreover, in severe forms. So if probably we tried an intervention where we can supplement maybe certain groups of mothers who may be deficient in vitamin A, probably we could prevent asthma in children and maybe in adults. Of course, an adult, we still need vitamin A beyond the eyes and other and the skin, but in terms of the respiratory system, it's actually, if you're deficient, can lead to certain changes within your epithelium. For example, what they call necrotizing tracheobronchiolitis and squamous metaplasia. Now the good thing, when you're an adult, these problems can be reversed. But for the child, or the person who is still in the womb, those problems are irreversible. So as you take care of yourself, think about the unborn child. Then I moved a bit to iron, which we supplement in our mothers, the polysaturated fatty acid, zinc, vitamin D and E. Those ones have also been started, studied rather, and the deficiency of those has been associated with causing illnesses and asthma in childhood, and then COPD in adults. So if probably want to try and prevent those huge figures I presented in the first slide, maybe we need to look at some of these micronutrients and find out what making sure that people have them in plenty. Extra life, again, I think this one already know that if you have vitamin A deficiency as a child, you have higher incidence of respiratory infections, you have more severe asthma, and like I said, the changes in adults. And then vitamin D has also been looked at as a risk factor for asthma, especially severe asthma. I have an MBA student who looked at that I think so she would present what, what, what levels of vitamin D she has come up and the risk of severe pneumonia, as well as asthma exacerbation. So what this means that if we had supplementation, for example, of vitamin D among certain phenotypes of people with asthma, especially the frequent exacerbators, maybe we would cut down the number of exacerbations that they have. And I put here, where is Dr. Alex? There is what we call the lung microbiome. It's basically the bacteria you have in your lung. But interestingly, it is influenced by what happens during the neonatal period, in what they term as the gut lung axis. So once you are born, how quickly you feed and what you feed on eventually influences what microbiota, like they say, grows in your gut. And that has an influence on how your lung epithelium grows and what microbiome you end up with within the lung epithelium. And we now know that the lung microbiome actually influences the development of diseases like asthma, like COPD, but also infections. So again, it's very important during the extra life. 
I'll go to another environmental factor, maybe which we shall now look at tobacco smoke. Right now, we don't have a huge problem of tobacco compared to other countries. But since we are urbanizing and we want high income status by the year, okay, middle. <laughs> <laughs> so we might go along with our problems of high income countries, including tobacco smoke. And when I say tobacco smoke, it's not really about cigarettes, it's any form of tobacco. So the nicotine, which is in that tobacco, we know that it really crosses the placenta. And what it does to the unborn child is that it produces the transplacental nutrition and oxygen. And as a result, you'll have diminished, diminished alveolar surface area, the blood air barrier will be thickened, you have reduced lung weight, everything is going wrong with your lungs because your mom is actually smoking or using tobacco. And of course, it will affect the airway branching. The other way nicotine affects the development of your lungs that it will prevent or it will prohibit the fibroblasts from proliferating and migrating. And yet we know that these fibroblasts eventually are the ones which provide the structural support for the new sector between the different alveoli. So at the end of the day, the process of alveolization is actually affected because your mom is smoking about. And then very important, this was something which I found recently, that this nicotine, there is a way it suppresses the energy production. And we know that we have the sodium, potassium, etiphase palm, which helps in stabilizing the membranes within the alveoli. But if it's failing because of nicotine, then we have a lot of alveoli actually rupturing. So as you're trying to develop, they actually just rupture. At the end of the day, you end up with very few alveoli for support more lung functioning. And what is important for tobacco smoke, this change is actually persist even during adulthood. I want to move to the next of biomass smoke. Maybe I'll summarize to say that when we say biomass smoke, we are looking at carbon monoxide coming from the smoke that is coming after using firewood or charcoal, whatever it is that smoke. Or we have particulate matter or sulfur dioxide. So all these air pollutants that are produced by biomass smoke, they cause chronic inflammation. And we know there are some diseases, lung diseases which are clearly associated with chronic inflammation like asthma and like COPD. But of course the damage that they also cause may predispose you to getting infections. I'll not go through the details of what carbon monoxide does, we know it's carbon, carbon hemoglobin and uh, oxygen dissection curve and those ones I think can read on our own. But I think the major important thing from this is to know that biomass smoke actually causes chronic inflammation and will eventually predispose you to get to lung diseases. Some interventions have been tried, a few in Africa, some in other countries where which are a little bit similar to Africa. But I think generally speaking, nutrition seems to come across as one of the big factors influencing lung health. But I think we haven't thought so much about it in terms of lung health. We usually think about having a baby with normal weight, no IUGR and so forth. So there is a study that was done in the PAL. The PAL is a little bit similar, I think, to Uganda. So what happened that in this study, they were doing totally a different study. They had preposed, what are they called? Women who were lying to conceive. Okay? So they had two arms, one arm received vitamin A, preconception, the other arm did not receive. They also received vitamin A throughout pregnancy. So when these babies were born, they were followed up until 13 years of age. And they wanted to find out what is the difference in lung functioning of these two groups of children. Born to these mothers, those who received vitamin A supplementation, and those who did not receive vitamin A supplementation. supplementation. And that's when they discovered that those children whose mothers received vitamin A supplementation actually had better lung health compared to the other group. So that's one of the studies that has tried to look at nutrition. Other studies have been done in countries where nutrition is not a problem, so they haven't found any difference. But we think if we did such a study within our context where malnutrition, especially maternal malnutrition is a problem, maybe we might be able to get some differences and be able to make some recommendations. 
Then in terms of biomass smoke, most of that studies, there are quite many in South America, in Asia, in Africa, that have tried to look at reduction of exposure to biomass smoke. But most of the results are really disappointing. I just wanted to point out one, the PAP study, which was really done in Malawi. And what they did was to give clean cook stoves to different arms or homes. But they eventually discovered that whether you receive that clean cook stove or not, the instance of pneumonia in your children did not change. And there were two possible explanations. Either people did not use the stoves, or the intervention came in late when there was already land damage. We are kind of more convinced that by the time they intervened, there was already damage which had happened either during the uterine or in early neonatal period. And therefore, whether you give me a clean stop or not, it may not change my trajectory in terms of that health. And then, the lab which did a study, we just concluded, we called it a midwife-led study. We called it an intervention study, but we're trying to see if we had a health education program during antenatal clinic. What are the thoughts of the pregnant women in trying to think through changing their behavior at the time of cooking? So it really looking at feasibility and acceptability of some of the things we are suggesting, like when you put the fire, the wood in the fire, you can you don't have to sit there and like judge a you that have to cook and talk the wine inside there. You can move away so that you have reduced the exposure. So we found that intervention acceptable. We think one of the things we could do actually to be to introduce health education programs about biomass smoke during the clinical clinics. Okay. But very important to note that the reasons why these biomass smoke um, reduction studies are very disappointing, cooking is a behavior. And we behaved a lot as the scientists doing clinical trials, the medical way, we not involved the behavioral specialists, we not involved the social scientists, so most times we fail. So my appeal when you're trying to any intervention, think about that people cook for sure differently. They will prefer matoke, which has been cooked on firewood vis-a-vis the one from class four. Traditional reasons. So it's a behavioral problem. It's really not a medical problem. So we have to change a little bit. Tobacco cessation, we've done also some work. The doctor Wins is here. We have what we call very brief advisor advice program. And this one is for clinicians. So if you are a clinician in this house, we have a training program where we can teach you how to very briefly, even with a very long line of patients, say something about the patient who has been smoking and encourage them to stop. So you're welcome to learn more about it from Dr. Katajira here. He's the expert on that. And of course, there are the health literacy and rehabilitative programs which you can do. Other extraterrestrial interventions, I think this one's already largely in place, like when you talk about vaccination, breastfeeding, management of infections, nutrition, so that's stuff that I was talking about. But also very important, when you're talking about tobacco smoke, it's not only to the pregnant women, we should be talking about second tobacco smoke prevention when we are seeing patients, because again, the children will be affected. So I just wanted to briefly highlight one of the projects we are undertaking as the Lung Institute to try and tackle the problem of lung health, looking at primary prevention, and we are discussing some of those things that I talked about. So this project is under what we call the Impala program, and Impala is Irene. It's an international multidisciplinary program to address lung health and TB in Africa. Yes, that's why it is a long one, but it's uh, sponsored by Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine, but it's going to take place in Uganda. So we are looking at maternal and economic determinants of lung function among young infants, and we are going to develop a birth cohort, which we think we can follow up to study more and more. And basically the aim is to describe what are those maternal and household factors that could be associated with lung function in infants. And how about eight objectives? There are very many, but in summary, we are looking at association between the mother's diet and lung function of her infant. We are looking at exposure to air pollutants, the biomass smoke that I talked about, and the PM and carbon monoxide, and how that impacts on the lung function of her baby. We also want to see how does the lung function of the mother, so we are going to measure the lung function of the mother and how that correlates with the lung function of her baby. And then we shall look at how to 
think this one is really modeling, looking at the measurements of PM25 and how they can correlate with carbon monoxide measurements. But very important, we are becoming a little bit flexible as medical people. We want to go beyond just looking at the clinical aspect and look at the household level. So we are going to look at how food insecurity within the household and the dietary diversity of the pregnant mother can impact on the lung function of the baby. So not just the amount of food that the mother eats, but how diverse. Another thing within there is we are going to assess if we have so much food or different types of food within the household, how much is accessible to the pregnant women within that home, looking at the cultural aspect, looking at the traditional aspects. And we are going to compare what happens during pregnancy and even the postnatal period. We think that there are differences in the way women feed at the different times, and that may actually impact on the lung function. So it's going to be in Chamliwa. I think that is southwest. It's in central. But Chamliwa is in Kalogu district. So you take Masaka Road and you branch off. Yeah, it's in central. You go Google and say south, southwest. In fact, they say southwest. That's why I was wondering. It depends whether you are looking at it in the context of Uganda region or, or you are looking at the global map. But it's in Chamliwa. <laughs> So we're going to recruit 560 pregnant women, and we think out of 560 pregnant women, taking care of uh, abortions, taking care of the early neonatal days, taking care of the IVFDs, taking care of the lost follow-up, we shall eventually have 345 young infants in whom we shall measure lung function. So maybe I can just describe this is a busy flight slide. But we are going to have four time points when we are going to see these people. First, during the dental clinic, they come and we enroll them into the study. We take the traffic history as usual, look at their respiratory health. Then we shall administer the food frequency questionnaire. That really just gives us how diverse their diet is during pregnancy, ask about smoking and other things. But we should also do some blood, basically to measure vitamin D. And since we are going to use dry blood spots, maybe at a later time, we might be able to measure other nutrients. And then we shall visit that same mother when she's still pregnant and go to her home. That's where we're going to collect data on data and diversity, socioeconomic status, the air pollution within her home. Because we think the environment within her home is the best way to estimate how much of the air pollution that she's actually inhaling in. Then when she gives birth, we shall call her back to the clinic. We shall then measure her lung function because we cannot do spirit in a pregnant woman. But also, most important, we shall do lung function in the baby between five to six weeks. It's a new technique that we are going to learn. And I just want to let you know that even lung function can be done as early as one week after birth. So we are going to do that. And then again, we shall do in the postnatal period, around five to six weeks, we shall collect that data again about food consumption, social economic status, and the energy use, or what we call the energy poverty. So some of the things we are going to use. The first one is called the air quality monitor. We just stick it in a building like this one, and it will collect all the impurities and read off, and it will tell us how much impurities you have in your surroundings. So if they put it here by the end of the session, it will tell us how much impurities we have inhaled in. Then this one is personal. For the pregnant mom, she basically just puts it here, like you put a pen, about 24 hours. So it's the best approximation of the air pollutants is actually breathing because it's so next to her. And then for lung function testing in infants, it's called tidal breath analysis. It's just like giving an oxygen mask for it, a baby. It's a nanny basin, you just put a mask and then as the baby breathes, that is called tidal breathing. The measurements are being recorded on the computer and then you can interpret so that it can give us an idea of how well or bad the lung function is. So we think that out of this study, maybe we might be able to learn what is the relationship between the maternal diet, the maternal lung function, the household economic status, and the lung function of the infant. And the reason why we are doing this is really a baseline study, but we want to find out, can we do trials? If, for example, we find that maybe vitamin A, vitamin D, or this diet is associated with poor lung function in the infant, can we do trials? 
and therefore eventually inform public health interventions like use of medicine and capsules during pregnancies and things like that. That's really the rationale. And it's all in really trying to control the lung disease in childhood and adulthood. So maybe the key messages, which you can have your key messages, depending on what you want to talk about the session, but I think from this, one of the things I want us to take away is that early life events, and when I say early life, life begins at conception. That one, I'm sure, I that's why the, 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 the cardiac, what is that, echo machine, can, the ultrasound machine can show a heart. So life begins at conception. So when we're talking about early life, I'm talking about right from conception. So those early life events actually provide a substrate for chronic respiratory diseases. With later events, what can happen, happen to you after birth or as you grow up, pulling that trigger? Because what we know is that by birth you may not have any symptoms even during your childhood, no symptoms, but you have suboptimal lung function. Then something happens during the later life that triggers the manifestation of lung diseases. And therefore, if we are to prevent lung disease, we need to develop models that are looking at life and life events or other influences. And since the few studies that have been tried show that some may be successful, others may be successful, but what we know is that lung health is determined by you know, many factors, not just one single factor. So if you are going to intervene, then it has to be a package. So we have to tackle environment small, we have to tackle nutrition, we have to tackle tobacco, so that by the end of the day, this mother is free from all these environmental influences. Therefore, her babies will have better lung function. Some of the references, you don't have to bother about that, but that's the really ethics of academia. But you must recognize the source of your information. This is a very important slide for me because I am not the founder of this project. But the most important statement for this session is the last one that the views expressed in this presentation are not those of are those of the authors, so they are higher than me, but not the father, which is NHS. And therefore, if there is anything that is not right, it's not the father, it is me. And that is a standard slide. I have no capacity to change it. So in all presentations of this project, it shall appear like that in those colors, in that font. Everything. So I thank you so much for listening to me. And I'm happy to take some questions and contributions the project hasn't yet started, so we still have room to see if we can incorporate things we have not thought about. Thank you so much. Okay.